Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. And in the spirit of the trees, in the spirit of all of nature, and the spirit of Gaia, I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising, uh, where we're going to have the second of two programs on human happiness and well being. Uh, this past Sunday was World Happiness Day. And we are going to uh, focus today on uh, what constitutes happiness and also to talk about a course that uh, we'll be offering uh, in this domain uh, to uh, consecrate in some ways uh, this uh, subject, which arguably is uh, the most important topic that any human being can contemplate. I want to honor Aristotle. It was Aristotle 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece. That was the first person that we know of in history to seriously contemplate what constitutes a happy life. What is happiness? Many points could be made. I just want to bring in one. Uh, for the Greeks, uh, happiness uh, was uh, eudaimonia, and that meant happiness in English, but for the Greeks, it meant more the flourishing life. And the central point that Aristotle made that has really shaped the discussions about happiness and flourishing ever since for the past 2,500 years uh, in Western civilization is he said that when you contemplate eudaimonia, you're contemplating the highest good. That happiness is happiness and the quality of happiness is unique because happiness is not derivative of anything else. A very quick example that he gives is that he says, if you uh, uh, meet a happy man, you don't ask him, but are you famous? Are you rich? Because happiness is the highest good. But if you meet someone who is rich or famous, you ask, but are they also happy? So when we contemplate happiness or the flourishing life in Aristotle's way of viewing uh, things. We're contemplating that quality of being that he referred to as the highest good. And that everything in our life, one way or another, he said, either contributes to or detracts from that which we most fundamentally want during our time on this earth. So happiness is a fundamental category of being. And I just wanted to uh, bring that truth into our discussions today. We're all dwarfs sitting on the shoulders of giants uh, as we contemplate these eternal human uh, verities. I want to now welcome uh, Megan McDuna. Uh, she uh, has been the convener of the program uh, last week. Uh, she's the creator uh, with others at the Whole Being Institute of the course uh, that we'll be discussing uh, more deeply and will be providing in partnership with the Whole Being Institute here at uh, Ubiquity University. Uh, as you know, she's dedicated her life, professional life, uh, initially in the study of nuclear medicine. But then as someone who worked in Fortune 500 companies on the multidimensionality of what constitutes health, that took her into the realms of yoga uh, where she has been uh, very active uh, and the creation of the Whole Being Institute, uh, which is really focused attention on how people can develop a pathway 
to human flourishing. So uh, Megan, I wanna give you a warm uh, Aristotelian welcome uh, to Humanity Rising. Uh, and Megan will uh, uh, introduce the program and lead us in our uh, opening meditation. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Jim, for the warm welcome. And hi, everyone. Uh, and before we get started, let's do as we always do with a centering. So wherever you are in the world, I invite you to close your eyes if that feels comfortable or take a soft gaze. And take a nice huge breath in. And a big exhale. And let that exhale be not only a release of the air in your lungs, but a release of the moments that came before this one so that your muscles soften, your mind relaxes, and you fully feel this moment. Take another deep breath in. Big exhale. And as you exhale, allow awareness to soften from the mini me in the head and flow down into the entire body. So you get a sense of the container of self as you drop down and back and all the way into the toes, noticing the feet, and the ankles, the shin and the knees, the thigh. Feel the weight of both legs against the chair. How does it feel to support or have something else support you? Noticing the quality of the hips and the whole length of the spine right up to the crown of the head. Noticing the volume of your torso. the belly, the chest, the upper chest. Noticing the space inside the torso, the space in both legs. Letting awareness touch each shoulder and see if you can notice the space between the shoulders and the ears. Where? of the volume of both arms all the way down to the fingertips. So that your arms hang like sleeves on a hanger. Relaxed, soft, filled with awareness. Noticing the quality of the head, the skull, the face, the bottom jaw, see if there's any space between the top jaw and bottom jaw so that even the tongue and the mouth is relaxed. And just notice what it's like to fill this container of self with awareness. Noticing what's outside of this container of self and what's inside and how the breath becomes a bridge between what's in and what's out. Taking another deep breath in. Big exhale. <sighs> Opening your eyes, coming back into the room. And imagine that you can see everybody else across the world, across the globe who are here together now, or watching a recording during mental time travel to the future. Someone else is watching us in the future, and here we are now. Really good to be together. I can't think of a different, a better way to spend the next 90 minutes than with you. So I wanted to spend a few moments before I dive into content. Um, I think I might have met some of you last week when we had the first masterclass, and this is a continuation of that. And a person I actually want to bring into conversation for you to meet is Henrique Bueno. Um, Henrique is from Brazil, and he is my uh, business partner, dear friend, 
Uh, I'm so lucky to be on this journey with him. Um, a little bit about Haniki is he is the CEO and founder of Whole Being Institute in Brazil. So basically runs the international sort of translation of all the material into Portuguese. And more importantly, um, creating a container in a different community than the United States where Whole Being Institute is located uh, to be able to impact and touch more people, just like we want to do with the ubiquity community and create a larger container for this human flourishing. So he is friend, colleague, um, and someone I'm thrilled that he's here today. Thank you, Haniki, for coming. A pleasure to be here. I'm very, very glad and very happy to be with all of you here live and the future use as well. So Megan, thank you so much for having me here and to allow me to share this moment with you. Thank you everybody from Ubiquity for doing this beautiful work. And Megan, as I always tell you, and I want everybody here to know, when I am, when I have the chance to be with you, uh, doing a conversation with you, I feel that all my choices make so much sense. So thank you so much <laughs> for allowing me to be in this path with you. Thank you. Uh, very good. So Henneke and I are going to share uh, the teaching and the talk, and it's really just our, our conversations around what we mean by, by happiness. Uh, Henneke is also the lead faculty for the Certificate in Whole Being Positive Psychology at Ubiquity. So those of you who will go on and take the longer course, a deeper dive into happiness, um, he will be your main contact in that course. I want to take us back to where we were last week. I told you uh, of a time in my life in 1999 when I was sitting at an executive conference table with the um, executive leadership at DuPont. This is our normal definition of success. We should be happy when we make it to the top and we're sitting around the executive conference table. But as I shared with you last week, I, writ I had written in my pad of paper in that meeting that this is killing me, that quite literally there was a part of me that would die if I did not explore other ways in which to engage in life, to express uh, more fully this interaction with life. And that I'm not alone in this transition point, this inflection point in life, part of being human all the time, we don't get away from it, we cannot miss it, is the journey between no longer and not yet. There are points in our life, either because of our career, because illness strikes us, um, pain comes, suffering is there, we wonder if our path on life is, is the right one. So we don't miss the, no one gets out of life without inflection points of wondering where am I going and how am I navigating? So our last time together, I talked about what is the um, right or sort of more helpful approach to these inflection points, to these times of uncertainty where the ground beneath us feels like quicksand or unstable. We feel like we wanna take a step forward, but we really don't know which way to go. So last time was all about taking the next step. How do we actually navigate on certain times? And if you had, have not watched that, I invite you to go back. It's hosted in the, in the Humanity Rising platform. Today, I actually wanna continue with that uh, sharing of my personal experience in the hopes that it will set the stage for what I want to go over today, which is how do we live into this inspired life and what do we actually mean by happiness? A year before I was sitting in that meeting and I wrote that note, this is killing me, that made it obvious to me I was changing directions in my life. I was at a meeting in Philadelphia. And I specifically remember it because it was at the Marriott attached to Philadelphia Airport. You fly in, you walk across, you never even have to breathe outside air because, <laughs> because the airport is attached to the meeting room. I'm in the meeting room and it's down solar, so no windows, you know, we're in there all day long. And during one of the breaks, I step out of, into the hallway and I happen to run into the president of DuPont. And this is not the president of DuPont in Massachusetts, because there's a gazillion different presidents in DuPont, you know, it's a big organization. This was actually the bigger president of the entire, uh, not only the diagnostics division, but the pharmaceutical division. 
and I tell you this because a question he asked me was a question that in your dreams, you think this is this is what I want to have happen when I when I talk about success, that the big president of DuPont is asking me, Megan, well, what do you want to do in this organization? Because isn't this what we picture, like the big guy up top asking us, what job would you like to have in this company? I would like to, I would like to hear from you. And when he asked me that question, I inside I froze. And I froze because the only answer I could think of at that moment was not this. <laughs> I had recognized that I was coming to some sort of completion or end. And when the president asked me, what do you want to do here at DuPont is just not this. I was clear on that. That's not a really good answer to give to the president. You really don't say, hey, I don't want to be here with you. <laughs> So I do what I do when I don't know an answer to a, to a question. I actually ask another question. I said to him, Nick, did you always know that you wanted to be president of DuPont? His answer kept me busy for the next 20 years. His answer actually became a North Star for me going forward. His answer set the stage for a, a year from then when I was sitting in that meeting, what was I to do next? Help me answer that question for myself when I recognized that this world was killing me. He laughed and he said, Megan, the question I'm gonna give you is the question that the previous president of DuPont gave to me when I got this job. He said, the question I asked you, what do you want to do? is the wrong question to ask. He said, the question you should be asking yourself is, how do you wanna be? Boom, like mic drop to me. When he said that, that I should not be worried about finding the right answer of what I wanted to do, and instead ask myself what, how I wanted to be, it was like, it was like the clouds lifted and the sun shined. It was felt like there was a weight off of my shoulders. How often do we ask ourselves, what is that I'm supposed to be doing? Where should I be going in my life? What's the existential meaning of this life and where am I heading? It's really heavy when we think we're going to get happiness if we get the right job, the right partner, the right circumstances, the right home, the right business, whatever that what if is that's future oriented as if when we reach that place, then we will be happy. His question, how do I wanna be, really sets the stage for a deeper, more fundamental inquiry into this individual life that we're leading and how we're leading it collectively. Because those the whole world will tell you what the definition of success is. Have you asked yourself that same question? So that's what we're here together today. That sort of sets the stage for this, this sort of inspired life. And I'm just going to share my screen so I can... If you can just give me a thumbs up if you can see this. Yeah, thanks, Saniki. All right, so what I just spelled out when the question of how do I wanna be is that I was holding in my mind's eye certain concepts of who I was and what that meant for success. And in the certificate in whole being happiness, the very first module of the entire nine modules that we bring this thread through is how are we defining ourselves? This concept of self is actually a construction. We construct ideas in our heads about who we are. And it's not just oneself. It is, and we use this metaphor, a family, a multitude of selves that live within us, that we hold as mental constructs about who we are. So for example, we have our ought self that lives within that tells us what we should be doing 
what is the right profession we should do or be responsible for. That's the ought self. We have our authentic self that shows up right here and right now. We have our best self moments from the past when we have engaged our strengths and we remember these times when our best self has shown up that elevates and lift us in the present moment. And in our mind's eye, and this is really important for those of you going through inflection points or or uncertainty in your life, in our mind's eye, we hold a mental construct of possible selves. And some of these possible selves we are afraid of and we actually don't want to happen, i.e. I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to be homeless, and I won't be able to feed my family. Or a possible self that we long for, that we hope for, that um, we'll find love and satisfaction and happiness in a relationship, a, a, a best possible self where we're family oriented and having grandchildren or children that we love to be around. So we hold, and you know these versions of your head at 2 a.m. in the morning when one wakes you up and is going through your mind's eye about what you're afraid will happen, as well as that imaginative, uplifting, sort of creative endeavor of thinking about possibilities of future selves. And then we have an ideal self, and this is a mental construct we hold in our mind's eye of what we are aiming towards. Because we have to make choices today that will impact the evolving future self. And so being able to articulate our ideal self in the future helps us navigate into today in a way that not only grounds us in this day, but helps build resources over time and gets to the question that Nick had asked me, how do you want to be? Not what do you want to do? How do you want to be? And this articulation is what we call the ideal self statement. And before I share mine, I actually want to just turn it over to Haniki to start talking about the ideal self because I've been doing all the talking here at Haniki. And you, <laughs> I want you to talk about this because you did such a lovely job of your ideal self statement. So I'm going to sit back and hand it over to you and take it from here. Thank you. You know, what, what I find most uh, brilliant and beautiful about this work, and I love the story about Nick, um, this question, I always drew, uh, had this dream of receiving this question from the CEO of the company I used to work. I, as you know, I come from a very similar story of being a lawyer, uh, legal director in a huge organization in Brazil, and then doing the change and, and stepping towards uh, trying to understand how can I live my life in a way that fulfills what I really love and how do I live a better life? And I have a beautiful story about the ideal self uh, and, and the whole idea of understanding yourself as more than only one you. Um, that was very powerful for me because we always have all these messages and we don't really separate them. We don't really uh, make a construct in our heads to, to understand what's going on in our minds. It's a big confusion. confusion. And once we learn this, once we work um, with this map and understand the different versions of, of yourself, uh, it really becomes something that you can use in a practical level. And that's what most inspired me in this work. How can we um, understand life better and use this understanding to create and make better choices today? And I have a beautiful story. I think I have shared that with you already, Megan. Um, when I was on my path, on my journey to be here with you, to um, translate this whole certificate to Portuguese and to work with positive psychology, it wasn't a straight line. It wasn't always very clear. It wasn't always something that uh, it took me from one place to the next. Uh, it was very confusing, very messy. And uh, I remember one time when I was uh, starting to um, have conversations with you about bringing positive psychology to Brazil, bringing Hobin Institute to Brazil, I was fight. I was living a very complicated life. You know, my my wife Manu was pregnant of her first uh, son. Um, I was trying to find myself professionally after quitting law and quitting the job I had. And I remember that I had already worked this model of the different versions of ourselves. Uh, I knew the voices asking me that I should do it. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. I had my dreams, my possible selves. I had possible selves 
I didn't want. And I already have, I will share you, uh, with you in a second, I already had my ideal self statement. So I knew pretty much where I was, where I wanted to go in my life. But you know, sometimes you have to make decisions. And one time, one moment during this, 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 um, this path, I remember I received a very, very uh, important call um, from a very big company close to my, my city, inviting me to be the legal um, director again, a very high position, a very high salary. And you know, everything was difficult. I was trying to find myself in positive psychology. Positive psychology was very new in Brazil. Nobody understood me. You know, what, what is this guy doing? Quitting law to study happiness. What, what's going on in his life? And I, I said yes to that uh, job. So I started to work in a company um, in a position that I, read, I had before in a work that I have nothing against it, but it, it wasn't for me anymore. I knew it wasn't for me. And for at about three months, I was leaving my city. I live uh, in, the, in the coast in Brazil. I was leaving my city at five in the morning, driving one hour and a half to go to this company. I worked like crazy the entire day, finished work at nine, 10 o'clock, drive back to Brazil. My uh, wife was pregnant of her second son. My first son was two years old. I wouldn't see him. I wouldn't see my wife. It was a very complicated moment in my life. I wasn't happy with it. But, you know, the voices of the, the, the odd self, um, everybody found me again on LinkedIn. You know, he's a legal director again. I had a great salary. I had that status around me. So it was complicated. There was confusion. But then I remember one morning uh, during lunch uh, with my wife, Manu, we were sitting on the table. I was already, it was, I think, a Saturday or Sunday. I was already feeling that, you know, very soon it's going to be Monday again. And I'm, I'm going to be doing this crazy uh, back and forth to Curitiba, this work that is not really fulfilling me. I remember that after lunch, Manu um, held my hand and she asked me, is this choice you are making now taking you closer or farther from your ideal self, from the ideal self you have for you and for your family? And it was a very simple but very powerful question because at that exact moment, I knew the choices I was making, they weren't connected with the ideal version of me. So what should I be doing now in order to bring uh, more to the present, that aspirational version of myself? How could I live today what I really wanted for my life? And the next day I quitted the job and decided to change everything. So. It works not just as a cognitive construct, the idea of understanding of your, your many selves, but also as a very powerful tool to help you make better choices today. And that's what most inspire me uh, when we talk about these versions of ourselves. Thank you, Henneke. Do you want, you want me to move the slide to the next one so you could talk about that ideal self statement? Won't you share yours first? Because I really love yours. And then I can share okay. mine. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds... And you guys will be able to see that uh, Haniki and, uh, and I took sort of different paths to the ideal self-statement. Those of you who will be going through the certificate in whole being positive psychology, we will take you through a process uh, over a number of actually months and, and weeks as you craft your own, but I wanted you, no matter whether you were coming to the course or not, to be able to get a sense of what does it mean to develop a, a navigation system of how do you want to be. Uh, very powerful for, for here, uh, present moment, not just the future development. So for me, when Nick asked me that question in Philadelphia, I took the short flight home to Massachusetts and I asked myself, how do I want to be? Now, this was 20, actually almost 25 years ago. My gosh, almost a quarter of a century ago, which makes me feel old. But what, what I said was, if, what are the, how do I want to live my life? And three clear words came to mind. And that was to live, to love, and to learn. Those are very simple words, but ones that resonate very deeply with me. So... To live means that I am all in on this life. I'm not a spectator. I am engaging and adventurous in saying yes to the to life as it's showing up. To live life fully, not go to the uh, my deathbed feeling like I didn't step out in life. No regrets. All in. To live. To love. 
really to hold open my heart to my own self as I lived completely and deeply and to open my heart to others, to really love others, like not just get along with, but actually have a deep connection with other human travelers deeply connected in this experience of all its ups and downs. Um, So to live, to love, opening my heart, and to learn, quite frankly, because I knew I would not do a very good job of one and two, that in order to have one and two be manifested in my life, to live fully, to love openly, I would have to learn again and again and again on a moment by moment, daily basis. When I was there and when I had mm, some work to do, which is never ending, quite frankly, because we never really reach our ideal self. It's always a growing and unfolding and opening too. So my three words that I have lived with, walked with, journaled about, lived into, wrote, you know, they have been sort of the centerpiece of my life. I've been to live, to love, to learn. I may not know what job I want or where I'm going, but I'm absolutely 100% committed and know that these values, these ways of showing up, that I can rest in to live, love, and learn. Those are mine. Beautiful. And now let's um, show yours. Yes, let me share mine. But before I share mine, can oh. I just go back one, one, one more? I don't, I don't know if I told you this story uh, before, Megan, but I think when I was 12 or 13 years old, I had an aha moment, a very inspired moment. You know, I, I love to write. Um, I love poetry and music and arts. And I remember um, running to my, my, my father's bedroom one morning, very early morning. I think it was like five in the morning. And I woke him up and said, Dad, Dad, you have no idea. I realize what my purpose in life is. He just looked at me. He was trying to look at me because I think he was just waking up. I say, I want to be a poet. A poet. Huh? A poet. Yes. Yeah. And a few years later, I became a lawyer because, you know, according to my dad, I would yeah. have to read a lot and it would be quite the same. And after I, I, I got a good position and a good job and a lot of money, then maybe I could have some fun with poetry. But, you know, I had to first um, get there and the whole trajectory changed. So I think I do think maybe not in English. In English, I'm not, it's not going to be as, as beautiful as I think it looks in Portuguese. But maybe my ideal self um, added as well this dream of poetry because I wrote a lot. As Megan said, mine is completely different. So there's lots of messages there. But again, in the same way that Megan's uh, beautiful ideal self statement uh, shows her a path, you know, I'm not going to be choosing my ideal self every time. I'm going to make mistakes, but I know um, I, can, I, can, I can bring that model forward. I, I can bring it in front of me. Uh, and think about that before I make a, make a decision. Uh, and that's why the ideal self starts in module one in the course, and we pretty much works, uh, we work with it the entire course, uh, adding things to it. So you have a, a, a powerful vision of your future self to make better choices today. So yes, Megan, if you don't mind. You. I, I yeah. had not heard that story, Hideki. I love it. Yes, one day, maybe. You are a poet. Well, this is big, so I'm going to read pretty quickly. But for me, like I have, I have this, this poster here in front of me, so I always read. Um, I, I try to bring it forward and to bring it, make it present in my life all the time. So my ideal self-statement it starts with something very powerful for me. Uh, my family is both my anchor and my direction. And I decided that this was not enough, so I wanted to uh, explain and make it more clear for me. So my greatest present and future my best memory. It's a safe haven from where I live and to where I return. It's actually the lighthouse that illuminates and shows me the way. So when Manu held my hand and asked me if I was going towards or uh, farther from my ideal self in that choice I had made, it became so clear. I didn't even have to read it again. It became so clear that everything I was doing now was actually, I, I was living a life that was completely distant from this ideal version of me. I was completely uh, uh, away from my family and I was choosing that 
because I was listening to the off voices saying that I should be doing this, not the other thing, the thing that I really, I really enjoyed. The second part of my ideal self uh, statement is that I live in the moment and I appreciate the way. I will get whatever I want, choosing first to be here, living every singular moment of this incredible journey of life. I step firmly here and now and I walk towards my dreams, being here, uh, trying to appreciate being here. I allow myself to feel and to be human because I remember, not just I remember, but my uh, odd self voices are all the time telling me that I should not be feeling this. I should not be feeling that. I should not be telling people what I feel. So I decided to write it down. I allow myself to feel and uh, to be human. I unconditionally, and I like uh, to sometimes borrow Megan's expression as well, I radically uh, accept my emotions and experiences. As I accept law of gravity, I think Tal Ben-Shahar in the course, he, he, he used that expression and I love that, you know, uh, I nature to be um, commanded first needs to be conquered. So I accept my emotions is part of my life without judgment. I choose to act, never to react. That is not uh, something that it happens all the time. I react a lot as we all do, but I remember that, you know, I can, I can try every day to make creative, constructive choices instead of react uh, in normal ways that usually are not as, 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 as good for um, the things you want. Um, accepting myself, I accept others and the world around me. And lastly, I live with optimism and gratitude and overcome challenges. I look for and I find the good and beautiful in life to remind me to practice appreciation, to practice gratitude, to remember that my brain will probably be searching for um, what is missing in my life. So I have to practice to really see the whole. I see here and feel every moment like a child. I see the miracle in the common. So this is my ideal self uh, declaration that really supports my choices um, uh, connecting to other parts of positive psychology we study. Thank you, Henike. So the reason why Henike and I share our ideal self statement, well, it does help us when we verbalize it to hear it again, because every time I say live, love, learn, it's like a it's like a resonance within me of how I want to be. And I'm sure Henike, it's the same for you. But if that's all it was, we could do that in the morning looking in the mirror. The reason we do that here with you is so that you can begin to see uh, within yourself how you want to be. So I invite you in chat to write maybe even one word that you're thinking about living into today. How do you want to be today? Loving, patient, compassionate, zestful, happy, engaged, connected, at peace. Take a moment and if you want, journal it down first. And I also invite you to share it in the chat so Haniki and I can feel like we're not having a one-way conversation, but are connected to you as you think about these questions. So joyful, completing, love that. Like, I don't have to complete, I'm in the process of completing. That's a beautiful word. I have not heard that yet. Grateful heart, another joyful peaceful, relaxed, connected and fully on my path, curious. These are just words, but they also describe a felt sense within us that we're cultivating and also a choice point in today about what leads us towards or away from that which is our ideal, authentic and engaged. Uh, please remember to include everyone here in the chat. Am I missing someone? <laughs> Share. <laughs> uh, yes, Nikki, if I miss someone, you let me know. Or anybody else, if your voice doesn't feel heard, please interrupt me and, and help. Uh, and one part I that I think it's, sorry, mm -hmm. Megan, one part that I think it's really important about, about thinking about this is, well, if today you want to um, be a little bit more curious, how does that look like in your choices, in your actions? What can you do to really live um, that, that 
inspiration for today. If you want to be more peaceful, we will choose to listen to your music or to sit down and just read a book or uh, walk in, in, in the woods if you can. So how does that look like in your life today? How can you move forward uh, in that direction? Oh, great, good upgrade. And so I see Stanley corrected me, conclude everyone needs to be in the two field. I think that's what that meant. Yes, if you do a chat only to one other person, we don't all hear. So thank you for that, Stanley. Engage, Leo says not done, becoming. Love it. Uh, Melanie, thank you. You share your three words as well as laughter. Yeah, I'm with you on that one too. <laughs> Authentic and engaged. Very good. I appreciate that. So what we've just done is sort of go through a short process that normally in the class takes, you know, we, we focus on the ideal self for the entire, you know, nine months of the program, plus going forward in life. If it lasted me 25 years, uh, you know, you can live with this for the rest of your life as you explore these. What we've just done is sort of set the stage for how we define happiness and success for ourselves. Because again, the whole world will tell you what success is. But the question is, have you asked yourself, what does this happiness for myself look like? And as we go deeper into this question of, of happiness for ourselves, one of the things I want to do is set the stage of how does modern science define happiness? Because we're actually pretty lucky that Today, people are research, researching and studying human flourishing. So this question may have been asked, you know, centuries ago by philosophers and the ancient wisdom and Buddha and Jesus and all of the um, sort of deeper why, why, what's, what's important in this life. But it's finally, you know, science has finally caught up. They're asking the question, <laughs> what, what is this thing called happiness? So we just went through this process of how do you define happiness? How does the research community look and think about happiness? And I think it's important for us to, to, to look at happiness in a deeper context, because many times, and I'm sure, Haniki, you found this too, when people talk about happiness, they think it's me. It's a smiley face, positivity thing. Uh, um, if you think happy, you'll be happy. I mean, there's just so many cliches in our vernacular about what we mean when we say happiness, that it becomes convoluted and diluted. And so what I want to do is elevate the conversation um, from a really basic understanding of happiness as a smiley face is something deeper and richer and more nuanced because the eudaimonia that Aristotle spoke of was certainly not ju you know, just pleasant emotions, much deeper than that. Now, that being said, happiness is a feeling. So one of the ways that we can think about happiness is as a pleasant experience of feeling, what's called affect in psychology. Um, and the impact of positive emotions are pretty powerful. Now, we spend almost a whole, I mean, th this is sort of the basis of the of positive psychology, one of the backbones of why focus on positive emotions. And I think this came up in the last uh, webinar that we had. You know, we have a tendency towards negativity. Our brain is wired that way. We are more apt to notice what's wrong, what's broken, what doesn't work because our brains are protecting us from possible problems. You wanna be able to notice that tiger in the grass. So it's a very biologically oriented, what's called negativity bias, to notice what's wrong, broken, and needs to be fixed. What is more subtle and harder to recognize are the subtle positive emotions. But those positive emotions, as we focus attention on them, actually broaden our awareness so we notice more in the environment. And we build resources over time to become more resilient. So happiness is more than positive emotions, but it absolutely includes positive emotions. Those of you who are going through difficult times know that when you are able to even slightly loosen up in the negative emotions and touch more positive emotions like curiosity or even interest, you broaden out and take a, take a breath from the heaviness of negative emotions. So in the course, we actually talk about what are the ways in which we um, enable positive emotions to be more present in our life. 
and recognize that part of it is attentional direction. Like our attention really defines what we see and how do we begin to see the positive in our lives? Um, as Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar says, when you appreciate the good, the good appreciates. So how we use our attention affects how we feel in the day. But that's not all that happiness is. Happiness is not just an emotion. Did you have something to add there, Henneke, on the on the feelings, on the positive? I just wanted to wanted to say that that this is very powerful. Um, yes, happiness is partly feeling emotions and the understanding that um, we actually have a tendency to not pay attention to it. We, we, we let it go. We let it fly. Um, we we say that the, the negative is stronger than the positive. The bad is stronger than the good. So if we don't um, uh, train our mind or attention towards the positive, we might be missing uh, opportunities to bring happiness to our lives today. Uh, so that's something we, we work a lot as well um, in, in the process of the course. Yeah, and this is why it's sort of, sort of a downhill cycle of the negative emotions are so easy and heavier than the positive that if we don't correct for that over the course of our lifetime, life can get heavier and heavier and heavier. I love what Rick Hansen says. He says, you know, negative emotions are like Velcro, uh, and positive emotions are like Teflon. Literally, the brain is structured such that the, neg the positive emotions, they dissolve. The half-life of positive emotions in our body is a lot faster. It slides right away. They're much more subtle. They're much quieter than the stickiness or velcroness of the negative emotions. And if we don't use our attention properly to balance that out, we will, by the nature of our biology, begin to, our, our, our walls will begin to close because that's all we'll see is the negative over the positive. Thank you for that upgrade, uh, Henneke. So the, the, if we were to think about, and these actually come from the OECD, which is the Office of uh, Economic and Community Development, how we measure. So there are metrics around each of these. You don't necessarily need to know it, but what's important for us to realize here is as we define happiness, it's not just the smiley face. Second thing, um, we can define happiness as satisfaction in life. And you can think about this as a bigger context, right? Am I satisfied with this life? This isn't about happy emotions. This is about, you know, how am I showing up uh, in my work? Am I feeling engaged in my family life? Um, do I like where I live? Am I happy with my relationships? Um, Henneke, anything to add on that particular domain? Oh, I, I just I just like that it connects with uh, Sonia Lubomirsky's definition of, of, of happiness, which is both the experience of positive emotions, of pleasure, and the perception that your life has meaning, has purpose. In other ways, in other words, it's the af, af, um, affect component, emotional component is feeling good, and the cognitive component, which is going to add with the third uh, part that Megan's going to talk as well. So both of the cognitive and the af, af, affection component must be working together in order for you to uh, really experience the whole possibility of a happy life. The head and the heart. And many times in satisfaction in life, one of the things we teach in the longer course is how are you using your particular signature strengths in life? So th there is in the backbone of positive psychology, the study of human virtues. And all of us contain those virtues. And the more that we use what's called our signature strengths, the more satisfaction we feel in our life. If we're not using our signature strengths, we feel like we're in a desert, it's dried out, it's desiccated, it's not engaging. So knowing your strengths, using your strengths and engaging them in work, family, life, home, personally, will increase your satisfaction in life. At least that's what the data and the science shows us. That's been my lived experience. And, and of all the thousands of students who have gone through this course, once they're recognized and lived into, they understand now too how to elevate in their satisfaction in life using their character strengths. And then as, as Haniki mentioned, this idea of meaning. And sometimes that which is most meaningful may not always be fun and laughing and happiness, right? Because raising children, for example, are very meaningful, but doesn't may, you know, might actually negatively impact a positive emotions in a certain day. If your child's having difficulties or being kind of a crab apple, like we know they sometimes can be, uh, but it's a deeper meaning being a mom or a dad. There's, there's deeper satisfaction in knowing that you're, um, 
uh, you're deeply connected to another human, literally growing, you know, being within you. Uh, so this meaning, satisfaction, and feeling is a deeper way of understanding happiness. Heniki, anything to add on that? Just one thing about meaning and, and purpose in, in, in a sense that um, it can become something that really scares us. Like today, lots of people are talking about meaning and purpose in a way that you have to find that beautiful purpose for the rest of your life. That is something that you're going to change the world with it. And you have to be able to talk about it in a sentence very quickly in the elevator. It's not about it. It's, it's about how you understand and actually create meaning in an everyday basis. So how can I now be here uh, doing this, uh, participating in this event with you guys from Brazil, how I create meaning from this experience? How do I uh, look at my past and understand that all the choices I've made brought me here and that's meaningful. The work I'm doing, it's meaningful. So it's not something that you really need to, to discover. It's more how you find ways to create in your day-to-day -day experiences. And actually see what's already here. What, you know, the, the research of meaning is like, it, meaning is inherent in our day, but we miss it. Uh, we don't see what's already here that's meaningful to us. It's easily missed. Uh, so what we talk about in the course is uh, um, seeing the meaning in the moment, uh, not the big, the, which ties into the big existential meaning in life, but sometimes feels too big and overwhelming. But absolutely in today, there's meaning. I mean, why are you here? That speaks to your meaning in your day to day. You would have choices to go have lunch or go outside or have breakfast wherever in the world you are. But there was something about being here that was meaningful to you. So we do some exercises around understanding how to see the meaning that's inherent in this day for you individually. That's the bigger definition, an exploration of what it means to be flourishing as humans, because we can have an absence of disease or an absence of something wrong and not flourish. So having an absence of a disease or an illness doesn't necessarily mean that we are flourishing. These are skills we can learn. These are applications and interventions we can do today to better understand our biology, our psychology, such that we can live into a better today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Haniki to just talk about this connection between why bother being happy, other than the fact it feels good to be you know, happy and satisfied with your life and have meaning. What does this really have to do with our work in our profession? Yeah, I'd like to, to start uh, this, this conversation um, telling a story that happens to me here in Brazil. When I started to study positive psychology, uh, it was something very new here. Um, nobody talked about it. Uh, so it was very strange for people to, to understand that somebody was actually studying uh, the conditions that make life worth living, that makes can, can make uh, ha uh, the happy life. And I remember that uh, it was 2012, 13, 14. I would never write an email to an organization, to the CEO or the, the HR uh, um, manager, uh, telling her that, you know, I have a, um, a happiness workshop to offer you, a project to make a cultural change towards happiness, because, you know, I wouldn't get a reply from that email. It was like, uh, you're here to work, uh, to be productive. Uh, when you go back to your home, then you can feel your emotions and then you can think about happiness. Here's a place for production. That was how things were in Brazil. Um, so I wouldn't actually be invited to organizations to talk about happiness. This has changed completely. It, it has turned around completely. But you know what's funny? Now, I will show you guys, uh, you guys now some, some numbers that demonstrates the impact and the importance of happiness uh, at the workplace and in our lives. Now, we, we pretty much know that um, an equation that we carry, uh, we always carry that success and making a fortune will make us, ha will make us happy at the end. We know that that's twisted. But you know what's funny? Now I go to organizations and I give them numbers. I show, you, I show them numbers. But try to think about something. Imagine that today is a Thursday, a regular Thursday normal day, there's nothing uh, exceptional happening. But imagine that you woke up after a terrible night, you didn't sleep your entire night because you had a fight 
uh, in the evening with your spouse, with your partner, um, and you're not feeling good. You didn't sleep well. You woke up very upset. You didn't have breakfast. And in the way to leave your apartment, your house, you actually gave a bad response or you were kind of a fight with your teenage son. And then you're driving to work. It's a terrible traffic. You know, it's very noisy. Your car, um, this, the stereo, the music's not playing. So you're mad. Your day is really, really bad. And you're going to work to start a project that you don't really like, you don't believe, with a team that you don't respect. My question to you is, how do you engage in your work? How do you connect with people? How much do you produce? And how many times during this day, you look at your watch and say, oh my God, the time is not passing. Imagine then a different Thursday. You woke up very well, very rested after a very good uh, night's sleep because the previous night, you found a new series, a new show in Netflix, and you watched with your spouse, with your partner, and you had a lot of fun with it. Then you wake up, you had a beautiful breakfast, you give a kiss to your teenage son. There's no traffic in the way to work, very amazing. And then you think about that, now you're gonna start that project that you really want to involve yourself in, that project you really wanted, with a team, with, the, with a dream team, the team that you really want to work with. My question to you is, how do you engage in this day? How do you connect with people around you and how well you produce, uh, you are pro how productive you are? And probably at the end of the day, you look at your watch and you say, oh my God, it's already seven o'clock, I have to go home. Time flies, you don't see time passing. So the relationship between happiness and work and happiness and life in a general sense, uh, it's pretty intuitive, we know that. When we're happy, we engage better with people, we produce more, we engage, uh, we face life in a different way. But now I have numbers to show the science has, has brought forward many uh, proofs of the importance of, of happiness at work. So if you want to um, move forward, just to, to show um, the, 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 the bad case, um, we are facing a moment uh, with a very big mental health uh, problem across the world. So we know the brutal facts are that around 87% of people worldwide are unengaged with what they do. Uh, this represents a loss uh, of $500 billion just in the US. So we know that the way we have been living and the way we have been dealing with work and with your, the, way, or, or the way we face life, it's bringing this type of numbers. And if you can go the next one, Megan, when we look about this more than 20 years now, uh, science of happiness, the discovery and everything we're learning from it, we know now that uh, happiness at, and well-being at work have a positive contribution on all KPIs related to people and teams. Just for you to have an idea, uh, organizations that invest in happiness and, and environments uh, that um, are constructive for well-being have 300% more innovation. Um, and that's pretty interesting because if you see Dubai, they have um, the happiness uh, ministry and not a coincidence, but it's in the same floor of the uh, innovation ministry. So we know that people are more creative when they're happy. And, in, and what's the impact of creativity in today's organizations? Companies have 44% higher retention, 37% increase in sales, 31% increase in productivity, 125 less burnout and 66 less um, sick leaves. You know, imagine the cost for the organization, but not just the cost for organizations. Let's leave that aside. Think about the human cost of that mother, that father that goes to work and comes back home unable to be a mother and a father. So look at the human cost involved when we work towards more happiness and well-being in the workplace. Um, we have amazing results, 51% less turnover. So I don't have to talk to CEOs now about uh, the intuitive component of being happy and achieving more at work. Now I have these numbers to show and the, 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 the ball has turned completely because now organizations are finding that if they keep doing what they have been doing, um, just that old model of a lot of pressure and future incentives, uh, people are getting sick and the results are not coming. So it's very important that you under we understand that happiness is something 
that we should aim for, not just because it feels good, but it's also, um, it has many impacts uh, across uh, our spheres of our lives. Thank you, Henneke. And I saw a question come in about where, you know, you have the, in parentheses, the, the, the references, if you actually have the, the hyperlinks to those, if you could send them to the Humanity Rising team, they can post where those came from. That would be helpful. Perfect. Thanks. Yes, I'll get that done. Um, so what we want to talk about is, all right, this is sort of uh, the pragmatic of the how. If you're going to live into your values, because that's your North Star, and we have a deeper understanding of what happiness is, it just then begs the natural next step question, but how do we go about getting there? What is our daily? And this isn't, by the way, I heard, I saw someone had posted a question about pursuing happiness. This is not the pursuit of happiness because the work of Iris Moss um, in California showed that the more you try and pursue it, the less happy you become because you're constantly comparing where you are now to some future happiness state. What we're talking about is not pursuing happiness, but actually um, refocusing attention in the present moment in such a way that you actually open up to what's already present in here. You start appreciating this present moment differently. So it's not pursuing, it's actually living into. And so Tal Ben-Shahar, uh, Dr. Pratal Ben-Shahar, Dr. Maria Sarwa, and myself came up with a model that we call SPIRE, which are the five dimensions of sort of deeper living into this whole being happiness. Um, and I was going to hand it over to you, Haniki, unless you want to go back and forth and talk about these things. You want to take okay. it? Or... Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. And there was Mary Friends that asked, asked the question in, in the chat. Ah. And I, 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 before I talk about Spire, um, Tao Ben Shahar, he has a, a beautiful metaphor. Uh, he says that uh, to live a happy life is not something you can do in a direct line. He says that it's the same thing as looking at the sun, is where all the energy how the warmth, uh, how the light is, but we cannot look at the sun for too long, but we can appreciate, admire, and understand the colors of the rainbow. With happiness, it's the same thing. Instead of trying to get there, trying to be happy, trying to look at the sun, we can choose and act uh, in a day-to-day -day basis in the dimensions or the components that uh, constitute a happy life. So I love this analogy uh, that explains a little bit uh, what Mary Francis uh, is, quest is asking here too. Yeah, that's great. Because otherwise we drive ourselves crazy. Am I happy? Am I happy now? Is this happy enough? You know, should I be happier? And then we go on social media and see everybody else's example of being of their smiley, happy face. And then we determine, oh no, we're really not happy enough. Yes, <laughs> that's yes. not that's that's not a win. That's a treadmill. Um, so I guess I'll take S and then you can take P, blah, blah, blah. Um, so Good. we'll we'll go ahead and walk through each one of these dimensions. And again, this is we go a much deeper dive in the course itself, but the first dimension of whole being happiness is spiritual. And what we mean by that is this idea of meaning and mindfulness, that we're paying attention to this day, that we're embedded meaning. And it can absolutely mean your spiritual groundedness in your religion, in your wisdom tradition, um, your connection to the divine, to the earth, to whatever that bigger container is from a bigger meaning and purpose in your life. That's the S dimension. The second one, the P dimension, which is the physical dimension, says that uh, to live well-being, to live a happy life, you need to care for your body and to tap into the mind-body connection. So the first one is pretty straightforward. Um, there's no other place to be happy than your own body. And we tend to neglect that. Neglect that. And how do we um, have more well-being in our physical body um, with more rest, with uh, good choosing well how to eat, and with movement in, in our lives? But the second component, the second uh, um, um, information that comes from the, the P of Spire is that it's very important to understand that mind and body are not separate. They're actually part of the same system. So what I think affects what I feel and how I behave myself, how I position my body. And sometimes it's very difficult to think, to change what I think or what I'm feeling, but I can choose to move or to use my body to elevate what I'm feeling and over time, what I think about myself. So to really connect this idea that they're not separate and I can use both in a, um, um, from mind to body and body to mind in order to elevate my physical experience 
at the moment. Great. And then the third component of SPIRE is I for intellectual. And this does not just mean cognitive thinking, using your brain, academic study, although it could if that engages you. What it means is that what are the ways in which we engage in deep learning? And for some of us, that might be artistic learning, creative learning, a deep dive into what we're curious about and being open to experience so that we allow ourselves to live this life in a way that is um, open and receptive. So curiosity and openness to experience. The R of SPIRE, the relational uh, dimension of well-being is the icing in the cake. So every single study uh, that tries to understand the happiest communities, the communities around the globe, that have uh, the longer life expectation, the most uh, more longevity. All studies uh, show again and again that the happiest among us are the ones more capable to nurture a constructive relationship towards the self and others. So uh, engaging in your family, in community. So relationships are, compl- are, are fundamental uh, to well-being in every single study we have. Mm. Thanks, Hanky. And last but not least, we touched upon this today, this idea of emotional well-being, where we feel all of our emotions and we actually um, uh, practice nurturing our attention such that we turn towards the good and we build resilience when times are tough. So we both hold the emotions as they are and cultivate this sort of attentional directional heading towards what's good and sustaining in our life. Um, good. That's fire, by the way. A lot more to be said on that. Uh, I'm going to sort Kevin, of... Yes. So just, sorry, there's just a question from Robert about uh, Spire being an improvement of PERMA. I wouldn't call it an improvement because goodness sakes, I would not pretend to per, to 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 be better than Marty Seligman. So Marty Seligman is the founder of uh, the modern day founder of positive psychology. You could go back in time to Maslow and others and, and uh, say that they were the precursors to the present day positive psychology. But PERMA is uh, the UPenn model of, of well-being. In our mind, there were some things that we wanted to add to it, not better than, just different. The physical we thought was really important to have in there, for example. Um, so it is our take on PERMA, our expanded take on it. Thanks for that yeah. question. And, and, and if, I can, if also, I can complement yeah. that, yeah, um, it's also important to, to the, the spiritual has a, uh, is, 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 is different, it's uh, inspired. And in my way of seeing, um, the Spire module um, has a very uh, practical way of, of, of being used and, and in a day-to-day basis. So even though uh, PERMA, it's an amazing model, um, the Spire, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way to really uh, see your life in a day-to-day um, in a very practical way too. Yes. For example, in the course, we have a Spire check-in. So you can actually use this as not just a directional heading, but actually a temperature taking of where you are today. So it is not just, um, it's it's not only diagnostic, it's prescriptive in terms of what steps you can take to elevate your well-being. So I want to sort of redirect us from the content of happiness is what we've been talking about for the last hour and spend the next five minutes talking about the course before we open it for questions and answers. Um, So for those of, I know that there are those among us of the, however many people are watching this that want more of this, that this is deeply resonating with where you are right now in life. And you recognize that there's skills and interventions that you want in your life through an actual process to understand more deeply this thing called human happiness. So this is for you to actually walk you through what is the course so you can make a good decision on joining us. So this is the Certificate in Whole Being Positive Psychology, which is first time ever gonna be held at Ubiquity University. We've literally taught people from all over the world the certificate program from Australia to Mexico to Brazil to Europe and Asia. And we are very pleased now to work with the Ubiquity team to bring it to this audience in this community. I'm going to take you through the nine modules. And Haniki, if I miss something of important, just interrupt me and pull forward this notion. 
So we touched upon this idea of the many selves. We dive more deeply into that in module one so that you can, you can actually hold in your own hand um, an ideal self statement crafted through a process of knowing what's most important to you. And also this deeper dive into Spire itself that uh, you know, there are ways in which we can use this to understand um, what is it that makes me feel happier? Like you have agency today uh, and it's not dependent on a guru or a sage on the stage. This agency that you have once you understand the levers of what can be moved to make choices that increase your level of happiness. And so this is what we study here in this module is a way in which that you can understand your own happiness and how to increase it. And then once you understand this level of happiness, um, that you can practice being authentic and real. This is not bringing you outside to be someone else. It's actually bringing you deeper into who you already are. This should look familiar in terms of the different levels of happiness. We talked about it briefly today. Um, but the greatest thing I hear at the end of the course is when people say to me, thank you for helping me feel more comfortable in my own skin. Yeah, I mean, right, when you know who you are, and you live that authentically today, you're not faking it until you make it, you're not, you're not trying to be someone else, you're not trying to live a life that someone else wanted for you, but instead engaging who you already are at the deepest level in a way that's fulfilling. Then, so those are, that was for the first two modules. Module one and module two is all online. Uh, you have pre-recorded video lessons, but then you also have about every other week a live course conference call, we, a webinar. That's an old-fashioned term, conference call. Webinar where you all get together and connect as a group. And in this immersion of the third webinar, not only is relationships the number one predictor of well-being, relational connection is also hugely important in how we learn, how we grow, and how we create new habits. So in this third module, we get together for a multi-day immersion online where we create small group working groups of six people. And these are the six people that you go through the rest of the course with. They're learning pods. You're still part of a bigger cohort. You're still part of the bigger um, course cohort, but you have this closer connection with these six people. So every week you're either having a course webinar or you're meeting with your small group. And then you're having a course webinar and then you're meeting with the small group. Because we know that if you're just sitting watching a video by yourself, you're not engaging in the learning. So you're taking the information and you're testing it out. You're working towards habit building and you're touching base with your small team about what works and what doesn't work. This is module four, which is about habit formation. Did you want to talk about the next couple, Heniki? Yeah, Megan, what, what, I, what I really um, find it uh, powerful about, about the, the, the certificate program, and I have a story to tell about this, um, about 90% of people that comes to us in Brazil uh, to participate in the program, they do want to either add positive psychology in their career or they're changing from one career to the other. So they want positive psychology to work with. And 100% of our students, when they come out and they do the, their testimonials, they say that they've been through a change in their personal life. So uh, the way uh, the teaching is organized is a way that you learn by practicing, by really living and, 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 and then sharing this in big and small groups in a way that you really uh, make your learning stick. So it's transformation before information. And on module um, four, you will learn the science of change. So how can we really change and do sustainable change because sometimes we find something very amazing i read a book and i feel very excited about this new idea and that's all that it ends up being an idea uh, how can we and, and we start that in module four together with the small groups how can we really understand cognitively how change happens really implement change in our lives and through a support to the support of the community we create how can we make that stick 
and mm -hmm. learn to um, elevate these changes across the course. That's one of the reasons the course uh, uh, lasts nine months as well, because we need that period of time with people in order to really make the changes stick and, and, and find way, different ways to live our lives. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Uh, module five, um, we don't, our own happiness is not an island. And it was William James who said we are like uh, islands in the sea, seemingly separate on the surface, but connected in the deep. Unless we learn this relational thing, our individual endeavors towards happiness will, will always fall short of its greatest potential. So our module five is all about cultivating positive relationships, good connection with others. And it doesn't mean you have the one significant other. It means every time you come and you have a coffee, you go get your mail, you go get, how are you in that interaction showing up? What are the ways in which we know we can increase our felt sense of connection, especially in this day and age where we're feeling lonely and isolated. Uh, so we talk specifically about uh, let's practice this connected feeling. How do we respond to, to people? What are the ways in which we respond and show up to people? It's all about uh, creating stronger relationships. Talk about mo mo module seven. On, on module seven, we'll talk about something that is absolutely- That's six. Actually, module six. Is that six coaching? Yes, coaching. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I'm so excited to talk about seven shoes. So that's why. Yeah. So, so this is the realizing dreams yes. module. Yes. Yes. How, how do we make this ideal self version? How can we make the entire change towards it? So we use a beautiful and a very complete um, um, coaching model technique, the change model uh, taught by Linda Wallace. How do we use that in order to create a sustainable change and have that conversation within ourselves in order to make that happen. And if you want to work with coaching as well, you get, by practicing your own life, you get um, uh, prepared to use that uh, conversation to um, the coaching tool towards uh, other people as well. And I think what's really interesting about this realizing dreams module is many times in our life when we're in a transition or we're in an inflection point, we move right towards, I got to get a goal together. I got to reach my goal. You notice we don't actually start talking about what is your goal until we've done all this pre-work. So you understand your ideal self, you understand positive emotions, you understand sort of the negativity bias, habit change. So when you get to your goals, you can actually be much more um, present and committed because you've done all this pre-work. You ever start trying to find a goal and you're like, oh, not that, oh, not that, oh, not that. So mapping out the goal, doing all this pre-work first uh, helps you be successful in realizing dreams. And, and, and even more, Megan, maybe, and I've, I've done that many times, the goal I create to myself is based on the odd self voices. Yeah. So I yeah. should be doing that instead of really finding what's the real goal that speaks to my soul. Yes, exactly right. And so which which leads us to uh are we on seven now? I'm losing track. This is this is seven, this is yes. the yeah, this is this is what you are talking about. You are excited about this one. Yes, module seven uh brings Maria Siroa uh on board and uh, as a faculty member, and it brings the the the, the importance of understanding resilience in a different way, in the in the way through the lenses of positive psychology, because you know. The entire process and this uh, study and art and practice of living a happy life, it's not about getting there and staying there. It's about understanding that you're going to have the ups and downs of life. That's part of everyone's experience. But the sad part is that many of us would like to go from one point to the other directly. Um, many of us go through life with the ups and downs. But when you look back, you didn't grow too much. You Pretty much stay in the same line. What we want to, to, to bring about with this course is that yes, you will face the ups and downs of life, but you're going to create, uh, you, you want to find your strengths and, and, and techniques to keep on growing. So every time you look back, you see that, yes, I, I'm living in a, in a different way. So bad things happen to good people all the time. Uh, we must understand that you're going to face difficult moments. And even on difficult moments, you can find ways to make better choices and live a little bit better and find a little bit of positivity 
uh, in these moments too, and, and finding ways to uh, really grow after that. So the resilience aspect of, of positive psychology, of the emotional dimension of SPIRE, it's really important and we dive really deep, not just in this module seven, but on the emotions as well. Right. And then we move into leadership. I teach this one. Uh, this is uh, the idea that our agency over our own life is really an act of leadership. So I talk specifically about not only self-leadership, but how we show up in a directive leadership way, a shared leadership way, and uh, being there when life leads us. So I talk about a more complex way of thinking about leadership and showing up um, in a more fluid and dynamic way, depending on the context with what you're in. And then lastly, we get together for the final immersion, which is a, a, another chance of us coming together uh, on an extended period of time online, where the students then become the teachers and share a final project. Here's one that a, a, a mom did who came through the course who had a special needs daughter and wanted a new way to context the conversation with her versus what she had to do differently, what she had to fix. And so she created a game like a twister game that had all the character strengths that her and her daughter and her family could stand on different areas and talk about when they use their character strengths. That was her final project. She ended up making a business out of it. She made these mats, brought them into schools and education so that students, teachers, families, communities could begin to have different conversations that revolved around character strengths, what was right and good and sustaining in people. That's pretty powerful work. Another example of a final project is uh, a woman who wanted was recreating the next half of her life and decided to take positive psychology on the road by doing uh, tours of interesting places to elevate positive emotions where she did little workshops and then did travel involved in it too. These are two of hundreds of final projects by which people translated what they learned into the, a final project that was meaningful to them. And Haniki, if you have anything else to add about that? Well, the only thing is that it's it's a high point in, in the course. Uh, we uh, remember when Megan was here in Brazil, we saw the final projects and we say, you know, this was the last, it cannot be as great as this. We, we, we won't be as amazed as we are with this final project. And then I am on the sixth cohort here in Brazil already. And I'm always amazed. It's always, always exceptional because it's not a project that you have to conclude to pass an exam and you can wait to get rid of that and to finish and to turn that in. It's about how that the whole nine months of this experience uh, talks to your heart and how can you, how do you want to move that forward? And it can be to your to our life as, as an individual, and it can be as many projects are as a new business or a new project or something that really is going to impact other people as more uh, very regular uh, it happens with, with our students. Mm. Thanks, Haniki. So I want to just talk a little about it. If you went to get a master's, it'd be about $60,000 uh, for the program. And the question I have for you is you think about this program for yourself, what would be the value to you uh, if you learned the skills and interventions such that your life was more flourishing, more sustaining. I mean, honestly, 20 years ago, if I had had this, I would have jumped on it. It would have saved two decades of trying to figure it out myself. This is a coherent way of moving into the next step. So what's the value to you? I would tell you that, uh, right now we're taking registrations at ubiquity, uh, and I invite you to become a student of the work and live into it for yourself. Um, I was just thinking, what is the registration price for, for this at Ubiquity? I was going to share that. I think it's 3,800. 3,800, uh, yes. There we go, 3,800. Uh, so become a student of SIP. Here is the, the URL to go ahead and get registered for the course. We're beginning in May, is that right? Yes. Good. So we're beginning in May. We hope to see you there. And without further ado. Just one, one, yes. one, one, one other important thing is that uh, despite the fact that it is an online course, it's very alive with interactions and there's a lot of communication conversations. So it's a, it's a live, it's an online course um, with a lot of interaction and you get really engaged uh, throughout the entire nine months. 
Oh, we didn't leave a lot of time for Q&A, but you know, here we are, we have five minutes. Jim, did you want to join us back and, and see if you have any questions or comments? Well, thank you, uh, Henrique and, and Megan. This has been splendid. Uh, it's a, a marvelous uh, course. And you're right, we don't have a, but a few minutes left, but I do have uh, two questions uh, that I think would be uh, useful to explore. One is the relationship uh, between the larger world context and the pursuit of happiness in our time. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, we're, all of us are, are aware that with the pandemic, uh, now we have, you know, the situation in the Ukraine uh, that we have climate turbulence, we have more and more ecological, social, geostrategic instability in the world that mitigates against the kind of coherence and well-being that we all seek. And I, I'd love to have both of you just comment uh, on this. Uh, one of the indicators uh, that's been universal uh, in virtually every country over the last two years is that as COVID has unfolded uh, and is still with us, all the indicators of human disease uh, have also been increasing. So speak to us just for a moment of, of, of what the pursuit of happiness means in this kind of a kind of crazed world <laughs> context uh, in which we all find ourselves. Yeah, and so I'll circle back to the work of Sonia Lubomirsky, who looked at sort of what are the variables of happiness. And there's, you know, basically boils down to three things. Uh, what is our DNA or, or what's, you know, are we more apt to be pessimistic or, or optimistic? So there's a certain amount of uh, sort of biology encoded that shows up how we make our day. Uh, there is an environmental factor. So if you live in Ukraine, right, you, mm. that environmental factor is going to have a, have a, impact on you. And even those of us hearing it here will have an impact. The third part of that happiness equation is uh, our volition, our conscious choices, our deliberate choices. We don't have a say on our DNA. It just is what it is, right? So some of us will be tending towards more optimism or depression or um, some of our DNA is, is there. In COVID. We, we, we can, we can, and if we live in the Ukraine, you know, we, we, we are not, it's not, it's not our sort of responsibility because Russia is invading, right? The question is, to what extent are we focusing our attention on those places that we have agency over our own happiness? Mm. And no matter where we mm. are in the world, moment by moment, there are choice points. I mean, in some of the most horrific Victor Frankl in his Man's Search for Meaning, you don't get much worse than uh, the Holocaust camp, right? Uh, and in that, he had his epiphany about finding his meaning in that moment in the, in the Holocaust era. So even him saying, I have volitional choice here in this worst place on hell, um, had volitional choice on that. So we can watch the news, we can listen to it, we get inundated with an, and especially if we have a negative negativity bias already, which we do biologically, become overwhelmed and lose a sense of agency in the beauty of the day. The sun is rising, we are breathing. Where is there agency in your life? Beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you. Enrique, anything you want to add? Yes. Uh, one thing that I'd like to add to this is that uh, biologically, we have a tendency to look for happiness in the next big thing. So when, when something really great mm -hmm. changes, like I get a lot of money, I get a new car or I get married, um, we see the causal, and concept, the, the, relational, the causal relationship within these big events quite easily. But we humans, uh, it's very difficult for us to see the impact of small changes in an everyday basis. We don't find... I, if, if I decide to eat better today, or if, if I decide to practice gratitude today, my day is not going to change too much. It's going to be one, two percent of change. But once I learned that when I do this um, in a day-to-day -day basis, when I, when I do this with consistency, 
I can really change my life. Um, there's a quote from, from Annie Dillard. She said that the way we pass our days is the way we live our lives. So uh, the whole idea is um, maybe, as Megan said, I cannot change my genetics. I cannot change the world. I cannot quit this job at the moment. And I can do many things today to start living a better life. And, and the other part of this, Jim, is that we know now that people that um, live a happier life, they tend to behave more ethically. They tend to be more generous toward others. So maybe when we start to do this, we start creating an environment around us that uh, becomes more positive and, and, and stop doing the crazy things we have been doing to humanity and to the planet. Hopefully we can get that, that someday. Thank you. I just put the course uh, link uh, in the chat, everyone. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, uh, look at it and uh, take it because the question of happiness is of singular importance, as I think we've been uh, discussing for the past several sessions. Uh, now, the final question is, is from uh, Maria uh, uh, Frank about her experience that the more she has consciously sought happiness, the more elusive it has seemed to become. Mm -hmm. And you've been laying out here very uh, comprehensively, you know, the, the ingredients, the pathway and so forth. Uh, but I wonder how you would respond to this notion that, that uh, happiness is not something that can be consciously pursued as much as that it's the outcome of uh, other factors um, well taken in one's life. Mm, yeah, so um, this idea of pursuing happiness actually has a re rebound effect of making one feel like you're not enough or you don't have happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the work of, of Iris Moss who, who demonstrated that if in fact we keep pursuing happiness, we feel more unhappy in the moment. This is So what you have noticed in yourself is true. And that's good. That means you're paying attention to this fact of when you're future oriented on a specific thing or doing or getting that it's a sense of less than in this moment. So pursuing happiness is different than um, uh, deepening into this moment of appreciating the good in this moment, right? So there is a refinement on going outside oneself to get happy and then comparing it to levels of happiness uh, with yourself or, or your preconceived notions of what that happiness is and really living into this moment and noticing and appreciating what's good in here now and cultivating versus finding or pursuing happiness, cultivating and nurturing um, uh, ways of being that elevate you. For example, character strengths. When you use your character strengths, you're not pursuing happiness you are deeply living into who you already are and in that becoming more engaged and happy. Uh, and you can notice, oh, I use this, feelings of happiness arise and meaning arises in my life. That's not mm. pursuing, that's living more deeply. Kaniki? Yeah, I think that's where uh, the SPIRE model and the SPIRE check-in comes really in hand because it makes no sense to, to, do, to write down a New Year's resolution. Next year, I'm going to be happy. It's too broad, too subjective to make you really start to act in different ways. When you use this prior check-in, you understand yourself in your entire complexity. So today I might be really well in the spiritual dimension, but the physical dimension is, put, is pulling me down and it's pulling the other dimensions too. So what is this small action I can take today towards a slightly better day? And if I do this in a consistent way, I start understanding how to live my life better and to create well-being from, this, uh, from the parts that, that composes the whole. Well, thank you both. Uh, this has been uh, uh, very interesting, and I hope all of you will look at the course uh, on the Ubiquity University uh, website uh, under the link of degrees and certificates. This is a certificate program. Uh, we're also building uh, with uh, Megan and uh, Henrique and the Wellbeing Institute a master's program uh, because we believe that that the pursuit of happiness, the cultivation of a flourishing life is fundamental, uh, particularly at this time in history where there's so many external and internal challenges uh, to uh, a, a healthy disposition 
of being. So I want to thank uh, both of you for your uh, presentation today. I want to invite everybody to the after chat. You'll see the link uh, to the after chat session uh, in the uh, chat uh, a box. Uh, Megan and Henrique, you received it in your uh, email from Matt Robertson. So I hope you can join us for at least a few minutes where there's an opportunity for more uh, informal dialogue. And then we'll see you uh, all again tomorrow, uh, everyone, uh, for a discourse on one of the most um, powerful wiz uh, women uh, in the history of Christianity who was there at creation. And that's the life and impact of Mary Magdalene uh, by a scholar of Mary Magdalene studies who's just written a new book uh, bringing to light the, the, the latest research on this extraordinary uh, figure who played so prominently uh, in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. So that'll be tomorrow on Humanity Rising, uh, the life and story of Mary Magdalene. So thank you, everyone. Uh, see you in the after chat, those of you who can join, and we'll see you tomorrow, uh, same time, same station. Bye for now. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.